Hello, welcome to another episode of Stories from the Edge of Life. We have another inspiring guest today, Dr. Ernst von Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz, uh, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience, please? Thank you, Dr. B. And it's a pleasure to be here and talking to you again. We have a history, as you know. So my name is Ernst von Schwartz. I'm a, an internist. I'm a cardiologist, transplant cardiologist and interventional cardiologist. I'm in private practice um, uh, and I'm working at different hospitals, out of different hospitals, including Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, where I was part of the heart transplant team for many, many years. Um, the Southern California Hospital in Culver City, Los Angeles. Um, I work out at Loma Linda University in Southern California, um, among a few other hospitals. So I'm also an interventional cardiologist. I'm also a theologian, actually. I just finished my thesis on uh, theology, got a PhD just a week ago, a uh, work of 10 years, which I just finished. Thank you. And I believe you, this is not your first PhD degree. No, I have three. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly another achiever. <laughs> Dr. Schwartz, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Parag Bharadwaj. I'm a palliative care physician in the U.S. I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Schwartz uh, when I was the director of palliative care at an institution where he was heading the advanced heart failure team. So typically, Dr. Schwartz, uh, when we talk about palliative care, the Typical impression most people have is it has something to do with end-of-life care, if at all they've heard of the field. Now, you, on the other hand, got me involved in patients that were pursuing heart transplants, which is one of the most aggressive and cutting-edge intervention of medicine these days. So could you just uh, talk about what prompted you to identify the need for palliative care in these patients? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, the the issue is, as you pointed out, that there is a lot of confusion among the lay people, but even among many, many doctors um, about hospice care or end-of-life care and palliative care. And for many, um, even physicians and doctors, that's the same thing, but it is not. So hospice care, usually we consider um, if a patient has a life expectancy of less than six months, um, where we want to define the goals, we want to try to improve quality of life, in, which are usually incurable. And traditionally, as you know very well, hospice and palliative care was like the, uh, the, the topic for oncology, for uh, cancer patients, because there's no cure for many cancers, and oftentimes those patients needed um, help with symptoms, with uh, defining goals towards end of life, with making their life more pleasant, even though we know and the patients are often new and their, their caregivers that there's no cure, there's no, no light at the end of the tunnel. Um, palliative care is a little different. Palliative care is targets the same objectives, if you wish, in my opinion at least, and it tries to help us physicians in defining the goals in patients with incurable diseases, which might not automatically lead to death, like many cancers do. And the number one example for us, or for me as a transplant cardiologist, is of course uh, heart, heart failure. And... Um, in heart failure, keep in mind, this is also an incurable disease, but people can for many years, if not decades, even though they might have recurrent symptoms, they might have need for recurrent hospital admissions, um, they have need for surgical interventions or medication adjustments and so on, but we can't cure the disease. And um, thus, those patients oftentimes come back to the hospital, they admit it. Some of them are admitted every month because of volume overload. They can't breathe. They might have chest pain. They might have edema, swelling in the legs and so on and need interventions. So um, in order to try to avoid those hospital readmissions, we thought, what can we do? How can we improve the quality of life of those patients 
um, in order to keep them out of the hospital, because every hospital admission is a stress. It's for the patient and stress as well as their, their relatives, their caregivers. So one idea was really to get palliative care colleagues and specialists involved who help us with the, the, the symptom therapy. So um, I always had students with me working, and uh, the reason my students came to me, as you know, is, of course, because they wanted publications in order to be competitive for applying to residency programs or fellowship programs in the United States. So um, one time we thought together with Dr. B about um, how can we do a simple study without going um, becoming too experimental which gives us um, maybe a niche, an area which has not that well been established in the heart failure population, and then we might be able to publish some data. So um, an idea which came up then during all the discussions with colleagues and the students was um, the pain issue. So of interest, if you look in the textbook, um, the typical symptoms for a patient with heart failure or acutely decompensated heart failure, meaning weakness of the heart muscle, which leads into breathing problems, and then often patients need to be admitted to a hospital, is shortness of breath and edema and fatigue, among others, but not pain. Pain is a different entity, and we see pain, chest pain, for example, in people who have a heart attack or angina pectoris because of blockages in the arteries. So then we did a very simple thing. We looked at the ER, the emergency department admission notes from a couple of thousand patients who were admitted to a large academic medical center with a diagnosis of heart failure or acutely decompensated heart failure. And of interest, every intake nurse in an emergency department will do a pain assessment or should do a pain assessment everywhere in the world. And there's always those smiley faces from one to 10. If you had the worst pain ever, this is like a 10. Or you have mild pain that's anywhere between one, almost nothing, and 10, very severe pain. So every intake for every patient admitted to a hospital has a pain scale somewhere in the admission notes. So that's something easily to look at. And so I had students looking at that in a couple of thousand patients admitted to an emergency department to the hospital and um, with acutely compensated heart failure. And even though pain is not considered a symptom per textbook for heart failure, uh, we were very surprised to see that 85% of patients with heart failure had more or less moderate to severe pain. And that was something really new. So we published those data, and then we thought, so what does it mean for us? It means for us, if we um, accept that something like a weak heart can really cause pain sensations, then we really have to treat that pain. And that's when palliative care got involved to help us with the pain management in those patients, which oftentimes was diffuse, not localized pain, but diffuse sometimes or body pain, sometimes chest pain, so different forms of pain. And then we could find out if we treat those pain symptoms appropriately, then we not only improve the subjective feeling of the patients, but we improve their quality of life, and we even can reduce the length of stay in the hospital, meaning we reduce costs and the inconvenience for a patient to be in a hospital. So that 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 idea, that simple idea, looking at pain in heart failure patients, led to I think four or five different publications, smaller ones, but still, I mean, good enough for the students to get into residency and fellowship programs, but good enough for us also to understand and appreciate the value which palliative care involvement brings to these patients with heart failure. Moreover, as a second step, like Dr. B mentioned, we thought about patients who have heart failure but are candidates for heart transplantation, meaning they have a life expectancy which is normal after transplantation or near to normal, uh, but still there is a, a large amount of suffering. Um, there's frequent hospital admissions, 
before and after the transplant because those patients have to come in the first year at least every week for a biopsy through the neck into the heart and they are on immunosuppressive medication so they need frequent monitoring so it it is really a, a, it affects daily life significantly and even in those patients we got palliative care teams by Dr. B, led by Dr. P, um, involved with uh, significant improvements in, again, quality of life. And especially in chronic diseases like heart failure, quality of life is, is the that, that item or that entity which we can and try to improve in those patients because we can't cure them. And even if we put a new heart in, of course, um, that's a good thing and it's great and they have a long life expectancy usually, but they are not disease-free and they require a lot of monitoring and a lot of medication lifelong. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. One of the patients that I remember in particular that I got to see in the CCU when you asked me to get involved with the heart transplant patients was a patient who was waiting for a heart transplant. And, um, you know, having been trained in hospice, having taken care of a lot of patients who are approaching end of life situations. You know, I thought that was the most intense suffering that I would experience or witness in patients. But I was surprised um, when I saw this patient, his level of anxiety was something that I had never seen. And uh, of course I gave him medications. We had to, give high doses to control his anxiety. In fact, the most effective intervention was getting the chaplain involved. And what I realized was that these patients are actually oscillating between life and death. You know, the very next moment, they could have somebody walk in and tell them that they found a heart for these patients, or they could die with the very next heartbeat. And that, that level of mental angst is very unique to this patient population that I witnessed. And I learned a lot from these patients, thanks to you. Um, now, we did do a pilot study. Uh, I was going through some of my notes. Uh, I believe we started working together in 2010. We published this pilot study in 2012. Uh, folks can check it on PubMed, where we uh, took care of 20 patients two of which ended up going on hospice and two of the patients ended up actually getting a heart transplant. So we covered the whole spectrum of interventions for these advanced heart failure patients. Now, anything that you saw change in the care of your patients once palliative care got involved? Absolutely. I mean, there, there's so many issues. Um, but the, the, one of the issues is, of course, that we we are kind of organ physicians. So as a cardiologist, we take care for the heart. As a heart failure transplant cardiologist, we take care for a weak heart. Um, but those heart failure patients in particular, that, that's a multi-system disease. It might start with the heart, but it affects every single other organ and system in the body, from the kidneys who might fail over time to the liver who might be congested, to the muscles who might be wasted, to the brain which might um, have reduced oxygen perfusion, uh, you name it. So um, it affects, a disease like heart failure affects the entire organism, the whole body. And we are so hyper-specialized nowadays that we really, uh, instead of oftentimes treating the entire organism, the entire patient, we often really have to focus on an organ system and then get a nephrologist involved, get a hepatologist involved, get a, a whatever neurologist involved, and then and so we need all those we need a multidisciplinary team to treat those patients. And palliative care is not also one single organ entity, but it, it addresses, and Dr. B knows that better than I do, of course, not only 
uh, issues of anxiety, which is a major issue in, in many patients, especially if they're awaiting any major surgery, or if they realize that they have an incurable chronic disease. Um, sometimes, of course, we need psychiatrists in addition or psychologists in addition to treat them. But there's a pain issue, and sometimes we need pain management in addition to that. Um, there is the issues of uh, spiritual care, of course, and we have, depending on the hospital setting, of course, chaplain services available from different denominations and religions, of course. Um, it, it's an entire team. And nowadays, um, for the sake of the well-being of any individual patient, we, we really, we are overwhelmed um, as physicians just to, to, we cannot focus on one organ system alone. But in order to treat the entire body, um, we need a multidisciplinary team. And in my opinion, due to my experience over the last 10 and more years at least, um, palliative care is an essential part um, in the treatment of patients with chronic heart diseases because they help us. They help us in defining the goals. They help us with a lot of social issues. They help us with the pain management. They help us with the anxiety, with the adjustment of uh, sedative medications, making sure we're not overdosing them, of course, because everything is potentially cardiodepressive too. So um, it, it is it is definitely in the best interest of, of any patient to get as many specialists involved, and in particular someone who focuses really on the quality of life the patient has here and now and in the near future, rather than just looking um, at one organ function. Very well put, sir. Um, I do appreciate, Dr. Schwartz, you giving me the opportunity to take care of patients early on. Um, I think it was very visionary of you. Uh, one of the things that I did learn was that, you know, palliative care could be and should be dealing from prognosis. Any thoughts on that particular issue? Well, uh, prognosis is, is essential, of course, but again, palliative care should not be involved only if there's a poor prognosis. You know, I completely agree with you there. So, and that's the the traditional thought of many healthcare providers that, well, we need only palliative care when we need hospice care. Basically, when the prognosis is so poor and people are at the edge of dying just to help them to go through the, the last weeks or months of their life. But in my opinion, palliative care should be prognosis independent. And you know, Dr. B, you and I, we published on that and published a few editorials also to, to make that point that palliative care should be prognosis independent um, and should be really part of the multidisciplinary management, even of conditions which have an excellent pro prognosis. For example, those patients who are receiving a heart transplant because they have an excellent prognosis in general with a one-year survival rate way above 90% and um, uh, good five-year survival rates and patients do usually relatively well. But of course, it's still a chronic disease. So the prognosis is not the de or should not be the determining factor whether or not to get palliative care involved. I think personally that palliative care is absolutely underutilized um, in the US and, and in the Western world um, in the multidisciplinary treatment of patients with chronic diseases. Similarly, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, <laughs> of course, but um, I see a lot of patients with severe chronic back pains or joint pains because of arthritis and degenerative, degenerative um, diseases in the musculoskeletal system. And there's no cure either, but those people are suffering and often they end up just purely on, on, on uh, opioids for symptomatic pain management. I, I think even in, in patients like that, palliative care might be of benefits to get them involved early for the same reasons to really define 
the, the treatment's goals to um, alleviate symptoms, to improve quality of life, uh, because they, they can be the, the, the bridge, basically, to whatever, to pain management, to um, physical therapies, to uh, sometimes um, rehabilitation center admissions or sniff skilled nursing facility admissions and so on. So I think we are not doing a good enough job nowadays in chronic diseases to get uh, to, to utilize appropriately the, the wisdom and the experience and uh, uh, the knowledge palliative care doctors like Dr. B provide. Well, I appreciate your kind words as usual. And, uh, you know, one thing that really impressed me, Dr. Schwartz, is, again, not doesn't come as a surprise. He, your memory is on point. You mentioned a lot of things that we'd done together that I had forgotten. So th thank you for bringing those up. Uh, with that, uh, we will end this interview. Thank you very much. And we hope to have you again soon. Thank you so much for having me. Good luck to you, Dr. Bini.